thank you. Okay. Um, take two. My name is Marcy Whitcomb. I'm the public pre-K consultant for the early learning team at the Department of Education. I um, basically go visit and observe non-grant classroom, pre-K classrooms and partnership classrooms, um, work with administrators um, around support and guidance for pre-K programming and work with teachers around best practice um, and that sort of thing and a, and a whole lot more. Um, and I'll let Sue go ahead and introduce herself. Sure. I'm Sue Galant. I am the pre-K expansion consultant, and I do exactly what Marcy does, only I work with the grant classrooms. So we work together quite often oops, to provide technical, technical assistance and also do visits out to the districts. Great. So you'll get to uh, know our names and our contacts if you don't already, um, surely very soon. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into sharing my screen. Just bear with me for a second. Is it showing as a, let's see here. It's not showing as a slideshow. There we go. There we go. go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So like I said, we this series is an eight part series occurring every two weeks. Um, and today is the first of that. And we'll run into, I believe, like the second week of July, if memory serves. Um, so certainly, you know, when you've registered for this, you have gained access to all of those sessions. Um, feel free to come as applicable, right? So if a, a session is coming up on a Tuesday that you don't feel applies to you and your program, no harm done. We're not taking attendance or doing anything like that. Um, and we're also not planning to offer any type of one hour learning certificate. So just wanted to let folks know that ahead of time. It's really meant just to be informational, to provide some content for you as you look to expand or start a public pre-K program in your setting. Uh, real quick, the early learning team at the DOE is growing. Um, it's really grown exponentially since I've been at the department, which is wonderful. And we do have a couple of other positions that we're hoping to fill over the course of the next probably year, to be quite honest. So um, certainly these folks on the screen here are available to you for questions and answers um, and potentially more in the future. So many of you may know Leanne Larson. She's the director of our early learning team. I've introduced myself, as has Marcy and Sue. And then recently we've had Stacy McCoy join us. She is our new Head Start State Collaboration Director. Um, so we're really lucky to have that office on our team. It's not that way in every state. It's a little different everywhere you look. Um, but Stacy's been a wonderful addition for us, and she really works closely with all of our state Head Start grantees in Maine, um, many of which have a, a formal partnership with local school districts to um, conduct a public pre-K program. So Stacy's a great uh, source of resource and communication if anybody is um, in a partnership with Head Start. And then specifically for this uh, funding project that through the MJRP RFA grant funding, uh, we also have Jane Kersling. She has joined our team as the pre-K grant coordinator. Um, so she really works closely with your districts who are awardees of the funding. Um, to form a formal contract between the department and your school district. Um, and she does everything grant contract related. So she is another great uh, point of contact for folks as well. As the other sessions roll out over the course of the next eight weeks, it's not unlikely that we'll have other folks from the department or other agencies join us to help present some of the content. Um, I know I appreciate always having a face with a name. So whenever that's uh, available, we'll be sure to introduce new folks to you. So a quick review of today's agenda. It's not too lengthy, but nonetheless important to share. So we have some topics that we're going to discuss, three specific ones today. And then we're going to identify where certain documents are located on our site. Uh, that may or may not be applicable to everything that we share on today's topics, but certainly where it is, we'll, we'll make sure that you have access to those. And then, like I said, time for some discussion and questions. We have uh, saved for the full hour for today's session. Um, we like to have a hard stop at the end just to honor everybody's time. However, with that said, if conversation is happening, we're happy to um, partake in that as, as needed. 
So session one, today's topics, we're going to talk briefly about rule chapter 124. This is a requirement, not a recommendation. And then we'll jump into the pre-K guidebook, which is a recommendation, not a requirement. <laughs> And then from there, uh, Marcy and Sue are going to share duties and talking about the technical assistance process. Okay. So rule chapter 124, if you're already working in a public school system, then you're probably familiar with rule chapter 125. So 125 is the basic approval standards for schools serving kindergarten through grade 12. Once public pre-K um, started to grow and we were starting to receive grant funding from the, at the federal level, we needed to have something in place that addressed approval standards for public preschool classrooms. So that was sort of the birth of Rule Chapter 124. Um, and this was adopted into the legislature, I believe, July of 2015. Um, and I came on shortly after. So it covers similar topics as Rule Chapter 125. However, they're not identical documents necessarily. Part of the purpose of 124 was also meant to align with child care licensing standards. Many of our programs partner with private licensed programs or Head Start programs. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were setting those partnerships up for success and trying to take away some barriers that were in, in place. Additionally, we know that our early child care partners over at the Office of Child and Family Services under DHHS are also experts in early childhood. So we really wanted to lean on them and their expertise of early childhood settings and early childhood programs. So it was sort of a, a partnership there to, to look at the child care set licensing, to look at chapter 125 and really have a conversation and make some decisions around what's appropriate for public preschool programs. So that's sort of the basis of rule chapter 124. Um, it does establish school approval standards that govern the school administrative units, uh, which are in charge of implementing the public school programs. There's a link here, and I believe that Sue um, possibly popped it into the chat. She did. Lovely. Thank you. Yes. So some of the sections, well, not some, all of, all of the sections of 124 are here. We start with class size. So if you have any questions about what the requirements are for a public pre-K class size, you'll find it in the first section. Um, and specifically, that talks about the number of students and the ratios that are required um, in public pre-K. We also go into discussing curriculum and comprehensive assessment and the requirements around that, um, both of which are a locally determined decision. The Department of Ed is, does not provide any pre-approval process for curriculum or assessment. Uh, we're more than happy and always willing to sort of be a thought partner as you're making decisions around which curriculum and assessment is best for your program, but ultimately the decision is that of the school district and or in partnership with a, a provider. Um, all the requirement in 124 is that the curriculum and assessment aligns with our early learning and development standards, our MELDs, and that they are evidence-based um, programs. So what we're trying to steer away from it is teacher-created curriculum um, that may or may not align or be developmentally appropriate without uh, real careful observation and review. Um, in another session, we'll talk much more de deeply about choosing curriculum and assessment. Uh, 124 also addresses requirements around instructional time. So this basically is just saying that it mirrors the school year, um, operates for 35 weeks, and is offered for a minimum of 10 hours a week, which is very minimum. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, many districts go above and beyond 10 hours a week. And then we talk about the organization and school size, quality of your educational personnel, your teachers and ed techs. Um, there have been some recent updates to Chapter 115, which is the rule chapter that oversees our certification laws. Um, and so we, or not we, but the folks that made the updates to Chapter 115 added uh, pre-K to the 029 certificate. 
So if you have a teacher with an 029 already, um, he or she, if they're interested in getting pre-K added to that, would need to sort of reapply to update their 029 and give whatever uh, paperwork is necessary for uh, courses or professional development work to have pre-K added onto their 029 certificate. Um, but historically, it's always been certificate 081, which is the early childhood teaching certificate for the lead teaching role, and then EdTech 2 or 3 as the assistant teacher. We have some requirements around nutrition, snacks, and meals, and when to offer those. The school facilities, so the classroom size, indoor and outdoor settings, um, locations of restrooms, water source, natural light, those sorts of things. Some family engagement requirements. Um, specifically, this talks about uh, updating families on the progress of their child's development at least twice a year, typically through a parent and teacher conference. We also talk about community engagement. So this is a really important one, especially for those schools um, that are just starting pre-K for the first time. Um, and the requirement to reach out to your current community providers um, we are not in the business of putting anybody out of business. We wanna make sure that schools and local providers are really working together and have a real clear understanding of what each brings to the community, um, making their efforts known, having really clear communication strategies, things like that. Um, it's not uncommon for school districts to forget this piece. Um, and then there's this conversation and, and technical assistance provided um, to sort of band-aid it, which is not what we want to have happening. We really want clear communication from the beginning. Uh, we also talk about coordinated public preschool programs or partnerships, transition into pre-K and out of pre-K, transportation. Transportation is optional to be provided for public pre-K. If your school decides that you want to provide transportation to your youngest learners, um, then there are some requirements that uh, are listed in 124 around that. Records and reports of students, and then the public preschool approval, um, which if you are here, <laughs> then you've likely already been approved to start or expand your program. And then currently in chapter 124, the last section talks about preschool program monitoring, which really we've just updated that language. We haven't updated it in 124. We've updated it in our current communication to schools to be the technical assistance process. So later on today, when we talk about the TA process, we're really referring to um, parts of this section from 124. Okay, so I'm going to pause there before I move on. Um, it's a lot to know, and if you've clicked on any of the links that Sue provided, it's a lot to read through. Um, so if anything catches your eye as a barrier or a question, please feel free to ask us um, here now or later through email. So a few years ago, actually right as we um, were shut down and, and moved to a remote learning setting, so back in the spring of 2020, uh, my colleagues and I completed what we call the public pre-K guidebook. Um, and it kind of came up um, in conversation and almost as a joke, meaning that we were talking about how teachers in the field really require or should have coaches, right? Sort of like how a football player on the field has a coach or a softball player on the field has a coach. Teachers and administrators were sort of lacking, we felt in many scenarios, a coach, right? To really help guide them through this work. And so a comment that was made was, yeah, but football coaches and softball coaches have guidebooks, right? They have playbooks. They have something to refer to in the moment, in the field that they can point to and say, aha, that's what, that's what we should do or that should be our next move. So that was sort of a, a funny way to, to come to this end. So the public pre-K guidebook is just that. It's meant to be a resource for anybody and everybody in the field of public pre-K. Um, and it talks a lot about, um, it references back to 124, so it sort of takes the requirement from 124 and recommends how to implement it, and amongst other things. So it is a resource document. It's designed to facilitate implementation of high-quality, publicly-funded preschool. 
it is not a legislative document. It is not a requirement. And it is meant to assist administrators, teachers, and families. Thank you, Sue, for putting that link in there. So more specifically, the guidebook dips into standards and program structure. Standards meaning chapter 124, program standards, as well as our learning standards. We talk about student support ideas, things like challenging behavior, MTSS systems, um, special education referrals, collaborations and partnerships. We dig a little deeper into the possibilities of reaching out and braided funding um, and some examples of MOUs and such like that. We dip into pre-K budgets, where you can start if you're starting from the ground up. Family engagement strategies, transitions into pre-K and K. And I will add to on our website, there's um, a plethora of other resources around all of these things. The guidebook sort of just brings it together in one spot. Uh, technical assistance. Oops. Um, and then at the end of the pre-K guidebook, we do have some examples some example forms, some example enrollment policies, they're all in the appendix at the end. Uh, we have some checklists for materials and high quality furniture, um, checklists for conversations with partners or community members, um, some really great links and additional resources around higher education options, um, things like that. So if you haven't already had the chance to peruse the guidebook, uh, we definitely recommend it as a, an additional resource in your planning. And then that summer, oh goodness, Marcy, it must have been 2021 or 20, must have been 2021. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't Marcy and I uh, put together a seven part series where we, it was sort of like a text study, but we basically unpacked the guidebook. So those videos and those references are all recorded and available on our website here, Early Childhood Resources site. Um, it's sort of an accordion. When you click on unpacking the pre-K guidebook, it breaks down into what you see here. So each of those sessions is a video, um, and we just talk about more specifically the, the sections that fall under that. So you can see those there. Um, so again, just a recommendation um, if you're looking for some more support or have any questions, we're here and happy to help. Okay, right, I'm gonna jump into the technical assistance process and I think Marcy is gonna kick us off here. I am, thanks so much. Yeah. So we offer a technical assistance process um, for our public pre-K classrooms and their partnership classrooms. So if you are partnering with a private child, uh, private preschool childcare or Head Start, um, we work with them also and do the same process with those programs as well. Um, we generally start in the fall, reaching out to schools and programs that are on our list. Um, the idea is that we hit every program and classroom on a three, once every three years, so in a three year rotating cycle. However, we've had a lot of new programs um, and due to COVID, we weren't able to get into classrooms for a couple of years. Um, and we had some staffing before I came on. So we are a little bit behind um, and I'm slowly working through those class, those programs. So I kind of decide in the fall and in the spring what um, programs will be on my list, start reaching out. Um, I offer an informational session, which is generally an hour Zoom with a little bit of background on what we do, how we do it, um, and, and just dive a little bit deeper into what I'm going to tell you about today. So those programs will be invited to that. And then um, it's kind of like an open office hour question and answer ses session with information on that. Um, and about two weeks before the re visit request, I'll send out an email to schedule that time, that visit on a time and day that works for the school, the classrooms, the teachers, the administrators, and any um, partnership programs. Essentially, this is my job. I, this is my work. I do this, you know, all the time, but it really has, the schedule really has to work for everybody in the field, because if it doesn't, it's just not, um, I'm not here to make your, your days harder or your jobs harder. It's a, it, more, more of a teamwork thing. So the visit themselves, so we will, we'll, we'll schedule a visit that works for everybody. Um, the visit them itself consists of a classroom observation, which is about two hours. We use the class um, observation interaction tool and the class environment tool. And then we do an admin meeting, which is generally um, principal coordinator, curriculum coordinator, um, pre-K coordinator, superintendent, teachers are welcome to join. It really is up to the district um, 
who they would like to be there if they have partnerships, then it would be um, partner, you know, um, people from Head Start or people from those programs also. Um, do offer to meet with teachers and classroom staff prior to the session. And I think we did last fall, we did an open session of sort of walking through the tools, the, the um, observational tools and the environment tools, because it's my firm belief that if we go into a classroom and are observing teachers or classroom staff on certain elements, it really sets them up for non-success or failure, not really failure, but non-success if they don't understand what that tool is and what it's looking at. So I really like to try to get out the information on what the class tool is. Um, if you're familiar with Head Start or have Head Start programs, they will be very familiar with that tool. Um, but a lot of our public pre-Ks are not necessarily. So we do that also. Uh, following the visit, teachers receive a class report, which is based on strengths and um, sort of next steps. So we, based on the classroom observation strengths that we're seeing, and then sort of ideas for resources, next steps and opportunities if they want to use that information to kind of grow their practice, look for professional development opportunities. Um, they can do that. It is by no means an evaluation. It's been based on strengths and opportunities. And we also do that with the class environmental piece, which looks at the classroom as a whole. So it looks at um, displays in the classroom, use of space in the classroom, um, materials, different sort of, you know, literacy, social, emotional, math materials, um, and a whole bunch of other different things, but it's looking at the environment. So we send out that report and then always offer a time to get together with teachers. Um, do, generally it's via Zoom, so we do that virtually, um, with, that works in their schedule again. And we sort of, if, if that's not by any means mandatory, but if they would like to get together and talk about what was in the report, I'm very happy to do that. Um, it sometimes helps explain what we're looking at and what the different sort of domains and indicators in the class tool are which can be really helpful. Um, and then there's also a district report that goes out. So when we do the administrative meeting, and we'll see in the next slide, I think um, there's a checklist of different components of the program. So it's, uh, we'll, we'll actually see that in the next slide, we'll go through that. So when we get together to do that administrator meeting, we're actually, that checklist is gonna guide our conversation. So we're looking at um, how the school and district and partnership programs may do certain things. Um, and, and that certain things are actually happening and how they're happening. Because again, with local control, a lot of things are done differently in a lot of districts, which is perfectly fine. Um, I always find it interesting to see what everybody's doing because also it is it can be very helpful to other districts to know how um, you know different places are doing different things. So that's always a, that's always a big help too. So after that report goes out, there's also um, an opportunity to meet virtually with administrators around that report. If there are any questions, anything that they want to talk about, you know, anything to review. And then essentially this support is ongoing. So the technical assistance process is not just classroom visits and reports. It's ongoing. This is, this is what we do. This is our work. So we are here to support, offer resources. Um, we do a lot of professional development based on what we see as a need for the, in the field. Um, I love collecting that information from administrators and classroom staff because they're the ones who are in the front lines. They're doing this every day. And I want to, you know, help them with tools and strategies and professional development that is what they are needing in the classroom and not what I think they need because I guarantee you that's probably two different things. Um, so we do any sort of, um, you know, guidance and support for teachers, classroom staff, ed techs, administrators, curriculum coordinators, and anybody else who needs it who's working with public pre-K or partnership programs. Next slide, please. And so this is the, um, when we schedule two weeks out, schedule the initial visit, I will attach this checklist. The only, there are two things that we do actually collect and ask for ahead of time. The first one would have be the daily schedules of the classroom, specifically so that we can schedule our observation visits at times where we can do the observation because there are certain times within that tool, um, non-teacher led, such as rest time, sometimes meal times, outdoor time that we, that we don't observe, that we're not allowed to observe. Um, and then a copy of a current uh, memorandum of understanding with child development services. That is something that you'll find in the guidebook um, in, in 124. And it is something that is updated. It's, it's, it's uh, started by the school district. It's updated annually between the school district and child development services and signed in um, by both entities. And then we do collect those to have those on file. Um, I think there are samples in the guidebook of that. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask what might, you know, what might be in there. 
um, other documents and components that we that we'll review and discuss. And again, this checklist is basically the guide for the conversation that we'll have. So we look at the curriculum that that's being used, how how um, classroom staff are being trained and supported in that curriculum, the alignment with MELD, same thing with um, assessment tools and that sort of thing. We look at home language surveys, supports for children um, who are English language learners or dual language learners. We look at um, enrollment policies and recruitment policies and that sort of thing, or or procedures, not necessarily policies. Um, staff verification. So we're looking at their 081s, their 029s, um, ed tech status, and then their um, enrollment with Maine Roads to Quality. Um, we ask that they, there's a parent handbook that we look through and um, student assessment data that's aligned with MELDs and screening protocols and sort of what the screening tool is when that happens, how that information from screening and assessment is used. Is it shared with parents? Is it shared across the teaching staff? Do we share those at the end of the year with kindergarten staff? Um, we talk about the PEPG model for teacher evaluation and then family engagement policies and procedures um, and anything else that comes up around that. And so this is the list that guides the conversation. It's not a list of documents that are collected because there, we don't do anything with those documents, but we just like to have a conversation to see how, like I said, how different districts are doing different things because it's always, it's always, um, it's always great to sort of support other districts as well with that. So that's what we do with that. And then we also work on doing professional development around any, any aspect that may be needed. And I think Sue is gonna talk about on the next slide, um, technical assistance for the grant programs. Thank Oops. you, Marcy. So the technical assistance process is a little bit different for folks that are part of the MJRP grants. The process is a little bit more rigorous um, and, and not in terms for you, but we want to provide more support. And through the grant funds, we have the opportunity to do that. So for those districts, there will be an informal visit in the late summer, early fall. Um, I think with so many districts coming on, my hope is that we'll get out to see you a little earlier. And this really is just to help your teachers have a name, a face to put with the name and um, to get to know things, to be able to answer questions for them early on in an in-person format. Class interaction and environment observations will take place both fall and spring, all right? And those are the observations that Marcy talked about in the previous slide that are done on a three-year rotation for um, programs not part of the grant. Those will be done twice. And the goal there is that we'll be, this is part of the accountability for the grant process. And we hope that we'll see some positive changes through the technical assistance over the course of the year. And along with those observations, those will be, um, there will be administrative meetings fall and spring. We'll go through the formal checklist in the fall and then check in for updates in the spring. There will also be periodic check-ins with administrators and teachers to see how things are going, to offer support and to um, make sure that your needs are being met. And then ongoing individualized supports for teachers and administrators in the district. We're here for you to be able to reach out um, and get support on the things that you may need. And when we're starting new programs or expanding programs, that can be um, a more challenging process. So we want to make sure that your needs are met. Next slide. And here we have, I wanted to make sure that everyone's aware that we have a public pre-K open office hour. Open office hours take place the first and the third Thursdays of the month from 3 to 4 p.m. There's not a set agenda, so you can drop in at any point. And the dates for the remainder of the year are here. Once we get um, out to the end of the year, we will set new dates for next year and make sure that folks are aware. But our contact information as shared at the beginning of the presentation and as it appears on the website is we're always there for folks if there's anything that they need. And I will put the open office hour link in the chat as well. Awesome, thank you, Sue. So our immediate um, early learning team contacts are here. Uh, as I mentioned, the ends are directors, myself, Marcy, Sue, Stacy, and Jane. And you can also find this contact information on the early learning website. Um, so as far as content goes for today, we just threw a lot at you from 124, the guidebook and the TA process. And we were sort of thinking that 
as you're this time of year, as you're prepping, start thinking about next year, that those three things were um, sort of of importance to know now so that we can start off on the right foot in terms of requirements and recommendations um, and the level of support that our team can provide, which we're really excited and proud of, by the way. So please take advantage of reaching out to us for anything. Um, but in the essence of time, we have lots of time left. Like I said, we're here until 430. So we've got a good 26 minutes. Um, we're happy to chat, answer any of your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment. I just wanted to leave this up. So if folks wanted to copy this down, they could. Um, and I will stop recording as well, just so that we can have some open conversation uh, as needed. So. And I did put our emails in the chat. And I also wanted to respond to question came through the chat while we were meeting about um, certification for pre-K teachers that isn't 08, is both, are both the 081 and the 029 okay for pre-K? And it would be, Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, that we would need that teacher to have upgraded their 029 to include pre-K. And that is an option, not a requirement for teachers when they renew. So you need correct. to make sure that they have that level. Yes, and they've also, and speaking of adding pre-K to certifications, they've also added it as an option for our allied arts educators. So our art teachers, music teachers, phys ed teachers, things like that. Um, they were always historically certified to teach K-12. Um, and they also now have the option to add pre-K. The conversation of can pre-K go to art class if the art teacher doesn't have pre-k on their certification it happens it happens all the time there are many scenarios where our allied art teachers are more than happy to offer time for the pre-k class um, but it i will be honest it looks different across the board um, i know that there's many schools that don't take advantage of allied arts at all. Um, there are others that sort of have a slower transition to those classes. They might attend one allied art for half the year and another class the second half of the year. Um, for example, there are some that might only go to say one a week in instead of you know our other grades that might have multiple allied arts classes a week. Um, and there are some situations where those educators um, don't feel confident or ready to embrace pre-K students in their space. And that's okay too, right? That's a really great opportunity to have a conversation about what's happening in the pre-K classroom and how can we utilize the expertise of the art teacher, music teacher, phys ed teacher in that space. You know, So is consult an option perhaps, or could they come visit the pre-K classroom and offer a few minutes of their time um, if they're able and willing? And like I said, there are others who are open door policy, come in, the more the merrier. So it's really, it really varies across the state. Which was not a question that was asked, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to elaborate on that. I've seen some nice options. 